So now um, I officially welcome everybody to this um, panel in the framework of the Conference on Differentiated Integration and the Future of Europe, Promises, Pitfalls and Pathways. Um, this conference is organized by the EU H2020 project Integrating Diversity in the EU in DIV and the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, ACES, in collaboration with two other Horizon 2020 projects on differentiated integration. Um, this panel this morning focuses on modes of governance in the European Union and their implications for differentiated integration. More specifically, um, it focuses on experimentalist governance as an alternative or complement to differentiated integration and we will listen to case studies uh, from the fields of energy regulation, GMO, and banking and financial regulation. I briefly introduced the panelists before giving them the floor. Our first speaker um, is the main organizer of this conference, Jonathan Zeitlin, and I wish to use this opportunity to thank him very warmly for setting up this marvelous program and also for the impeccable organization. Uh, Jonathan is Distinguished Faculty Professor of Public Policy and Governance at the Department of Political Science of the uh, University of Amsterdam. And he's also the Academic Director of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies. Um, Jonathan is a leading scholar on the theory of experimentalist governance and its application to the case of the European Union. And today we will have the pleasure to hear first results uh, from a work package he's directing on the topic in the framework of this uh, Horizon 2020 project in DIV. Um, Jonathan will start the panel with a brief introduction before passing over to our second speaker, who is Bernardo Rangoni. Bernardo is postdoctoral uh, research fellow in uh, the project at the University of Amsterdam and he has recently also been nominated a fellow in political economy at the LSE. His uh, specialization is in the field of energy governance. The third speaker is Maria Weimar. Maria is a professor in law at the University of Amsterdam uh, and an expert on risk regulation in the EU, especially GMO. After Maria's presentation, we will give the floor again to Jonathan, who will present then insights from his research in the field of banking and financial regulation. We will have a very brief discussion among the panelists at the end of the presentations before opening up the floor for Q&A. And I invite everybody to use uh, the Q&A function in Zoom or the chat to uh, formulate your questions. You can also post them already in advance so that we can take uh, as many as possible in the Q&A session. And without further ado, I give the floor to Jonathan. Thanks very much, uh, Sandra. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. So I'm going to go directly and share my screen. And so what I want to do is to present uh, the theme of this panel and the, the work package that uh, I'm leading uh, within the, the NDVU uh, project. So let me begin uh, with a problem formulation. Um, that is the limits of uniform regulation in a heterogeneous polity like the EU. And it's no secret that uh, European regulation has acquired an increasingly negative uh, reputation, at least within the EU itself. Paradoxically, it has a pretty good reputation outside uh, the EU in many areas. And uh, this is partly due to the perceived technocratic character of EU rulemaking and its remoteness from ordinary citizens and national parliaments, the so-called, an aspect of the so-called democratic deficit. It's partly due to the politically contested characters of e character of EU rules themselves, which may involve value conflicts and distributive consequences. And we'll hear about that, particularly in relation to GMOs. But it's also due in large measure 
to uh, the critiques of um, the supposed misfit between uniform one-size-fits-all regulation and the heterogeneity of preferences and conditions in an increasingly diverse union. And this is where differentiated integration comes in uh, as an alternative to, uh, to uniform regulation, as a way of accommodating diversity among EU member states, diversity in policy preferences and institutional structures and socioeconomic conditions. And the underlying assumption here is that deeper integration of markets and societies requires uniform centrally determined rules which some member states may be unwilling uh, or unable to accept, at least initially. And where other member states wish nonetheless to push ahead, the result is differentiated integration. That is to say, policies and rules that apply only to some member states, but also to some uh, non-member states. And that, of course, is what our conference is really about. Now, Recent research, however, has shown that in many core policy domains, EU governance isn't characterized by top-down imposition of rigid uniform uh, regulation, uh, but instead by what uh, I and colleagues call an experimentalist architecture of framework rulemaking and revision based on learning from comparative review of implementation experience in different local contexts. Now, experimentalist governance, or XG, in this sense, overlaps with, but goes beyond, flexible implementation of EU rules, for example, through minimum rather than maximum harmonization, and through national options and discretions in EU directives. And we also have a, a work package in NDBU which is studying uh, that dimension. Here is a, a simple diagram of uh, EU experimentalist governance as an iterative multi-level multi architecture, which begins with EU institutions and member states jointly establishing framework goals and metrics uh, for assessing progress towards them. They typically do this in consultation uh, with civil society actors. Uh, the second step or element uh, is a measure of discretionary implementation by lower level units like national ministries uh, and national independent regulatory uh, authorities. And here, this is about adapting the general goals to fit local circumstances. Very important is the, the third element, which is uh, in exchange for this measure of uh, discretion or autonomy, the lower level units are expected to report regularly on progress towards the goals to participate uh, in a peer review of how they are doing and where they're not uh, making good progress towards uh, the, the common goals to come up with plausible plans for improvement uh, which are informed by the experience of their peers. And that then leads to the fourth element, periodic revision of the central goals, metrics, and procedures. And so you see that we have a cycle or indeed uh, a spiral of, uh, of regulation and policy making. Uh, arguably, experimentalist governance has some uh, key advantages over both uh, differentiated integration and uniform regulation. So I want to emphasize three. The first, that it accommodates diversity by adapting common goals and rules to vary local contexts rather than imposing one-size-fits-all solutions or dividing member states into separate groups of ins and outs. Secondly, it's a dynamic mechanism for coordinated learning through disciplined comparison of different approaches to uh, advancing the same general ends. And this can then be used to generate new policy solutions and regulatory frameworks, which may then in turn be applied in contextually specific ways across the EU as a whole. We'll see that's a, an important feature of the electricity story that Bernardo will tell. And finally, it's corrigible by design. Problems identified in one phase of implementation can be corrected uh, in the next iteration. So uh, here, what we are doing uh, in the work package and in this, um, uh, this panel uh, is presenting some first results of a comparative cross-sectoral research 
project. And our core question is how far and under what conditions uh, experimentalist governance may be an effective and a legitimate means of responding to diversity of preferences and conditions among EU member states in comparison both to conventional uniform regulation and to differentiated integration. And what we are doing is comparative process tracing research on three EU regulatory policy domains. These are domains, first of all, where the dilemma of accommodating national diversity has arisen with particular salience. They're all part of the internal market, for example, and where there have been corresponding efforts to develop experimentalist arrangements as opposed to, or in some cases, alongside uh, both uniform regulation and differentiated integration. So the three areas are electricity, banking, and GMO regulation. They each are a subset of a broader category. HSE stands for health, safety, and environmental risk regulation. Uh, as I've said, each domain belongs to the internal market uh, where the demand for uniform rules is strong, but each is also politically salient and controversial, meaning that the demand for accommodating diversity is also strong. And uh, I will now turn over uh, to Bernardo and uh, Maria to present uh, their cases. Oops. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, we pass the floor to Bernardo. <coughs> Thanks. You can see this presentation, right? Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Jonathan. Th thanks, uh, everybody who, who is attending. So, uh, as it was anticipated, I was uh, in this project, I was responsible for looking at, um, at the, uh, the electricity case. Um, and, uh, 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 of course, the first question is why, why should we care about electricity? And, um, one reason is that electricity is uh, is quite an important sector uh, and this is because it has cross-sectoral effects so just think about the electrification of transport or the digital communications we are using uh, more and more or the let's say the traditional manufacturing uh, industry so electricity really uh, underpins our our daily lives and this raises the question of how uh, it has been regulated in the eu over the past two decades um, I looked at uh, six uh, core examples or core issues within the electricity sector and I, as, as in the broader uh, project, uh, I did that uh, by adopting three analytical lenses, uniform regulation, differentiated integration and experimentalist governance, which were explained uh, right, right a minute ago by, by Jonathan. In this uh, slide, I want to show you, this gives you let's say a read a picture of, uh, of of the findings so you can see on the on the first column uh, the six examples i focused on uh, the first four are clearly uh, internal market issues there is a fifth one which is at the crossroads uh, between electricity and uh, or energy and and financial regulation it's about insider trading uh, uh, when producing and trading uh, uh, energy. Um, and then there is a sixth, a sixth one, which is very important, uh, but uh, is not, uh, does not really fit clearly within the internal market uh, policies category, which is re renewables. Now, if we, if we look at the other three columns, uh, you can see that um, starting from rules, uh, basically we see, we see uh, quite a common pattern, especially uh, for the issues clearly belonging to the internal market category, where we have quite a high uniformity. So rules uh, are, are very detailed, are very harmonized and increasingly so. And they don't leave so much uh, discretion to member states. Uh, and also we see that there is no, uh, no sign uh, whatsoever of internal differentiated integration. So these uh, rules don't uh, don't provide member states with uh, with the possibility of opting out from uh, from from uh, the provisions they are they are uh, offering. Now, 
in, the, in this other column on processes, we also see that uh, um, these largely uniform rules were, uh, uh, were to a good extent uh, developed and revised through experimentalist governance processes. So just to repeat, in a second, experimentalism in a simple, uh, in a simple uh, way can be defined as, uh, as rulemaking and revision based on comparison of uh, different implementation experiences in different local contexts. And in the, third, in the last uh, column, we, uh, we uh, look uh, at the external dimension. And here we see that there is a combination of external differentiated integration and extended experimentalist governance. What does this mean? It means that uh, the, the rules uh, not only apply also to uh, third country uh, actors, so to actors beyond the European Union borders, uh, but also these actors coming from outside the EU, they actively participate in the processes to create and, and revise such rules. As, as I said, renewables is a bit of an outlier here. So here we have uh, low uniformity. Member states are, are largely free to, to, to do what they want. Um, there is not so much experimentalist governance. So this uh, abundant diversity could be used much more, could be compared uh, and uh, debated much more. Okay, so the first, uh, the first uh, let's say, finding I, I would like to, to discuss a little bit here uh, is, uh, is this uh, high uniformity for internal market issues, low uniformity for renewables on the other hand, and uh, no differentiated integration, uh, in so, insofar as we are talking about internal differentiated integration. So this, of course, the, the immediate question is how to interpret these findings. And one view, uh, I saw that, uh, that uh, Dirk uh, is, is among the attendees, uh, I mean, he, with, with uh, Frank, uh, Schimmel Fenning, and, and uh, Bertolt Rittberger, I mean, they would, uh, they would uh, categorize, uh, if, uh, if I understand uh, rightly their view, they would categorize electricity as a classic internal market uh, uh, example, uh, which is characterized by high interdependence, but re relatively low politicization. For example, it doesn't involve national identity issues. And this is how they would explain the high degree of uniformity without internal differentiated integration found. They would also uh, uh, depict uh, renewables as a case of lower interdependence. So, for example, we can, uh, we can uh, imagine that it is okay for member states to, to uh, address climate change in their own way. Um, but also of relatively higher politicization. So here, uh, this would, would end up being a case somehow similar to defense policy, where we uh, observe a low degree of, of integration. However, this is not the only way in which electricity can be, can be conceived. Uh, another way of looking at electricity is uh, to, to, to see uh, this as a case of high interdependence, but also relatively high politicization as Jonathan was mentioning in, in his uh, uh, previous presentation. Um, after all, uh, energy uh, comes quite close to core state powers. It has historically uh, been linked to national sovereignty issues. So member states have been very reluctant to, to uh, give uh, uh, power on this to the EU. Think, for example, about the, the autonomy they still have on, on fuel mixes. There are a number of rules uh, uh, practically in every country to protect national champions. Uh, uh, of course, France is the, is the uh, clearest example, but it's not, it's not uh, an exceptional one. And often governments have intervened to, to uh, fend off uh, foreign takeovers. And, and so we see uh, quite uh, a lot of discourses about national identity also related to this very important national companies. Um, similarly, when it comes to, to renewables, uh, one could actually say that this is a case where interdependence is not so low after all, because we could imagine um, or we can think about climate change as actually a key example of negative externalities. 
if uh, if um, uh, the UK is doing a lot to fight climate change, but Poland is not. Well, then you know the effort is really is really useless. I haven't made my mind uh, completely clear about what is the most persuasive view, but I just wanted to I just wanted to to open up with you, and I would be interested in hearing your your views on, on this. Now, a second finding uh, on which I would like to, to, to reflect a second is this combination of uniform rules and experimentalist processes. And this is, uh, is quite a surprising combination because as we have heard from Jonathan a few minutes ago, uh, the classic experimentalist governance uh, uh, conception, especially in the EU and global manifestations, is composed by a four, um, a four uh, an architecture formed of four key elements. Broad frameworks, discretion to pursue a variety of approaches, review of implementation experiences with those approaches, and, and, uh, and then revision. And yet the findings that, uh, that, have, uh, have been, uh, that have been emerging from my research on electricity, and Jonathan will say something quite similar about uh, financial regulation, uh, actually are suggesting that we may be witnessing a transition towards a, a, an animal which is composed by, by two steps, review and revision, where the first two uh, are actually quite, quite compressed. So there, there seems to be less and less space for, for diversity. And yet, uh, something else uh, on which I would like to, 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 to reflect is that um, the pressure for uniform uh, rules generated by interdependence does not uh, automatically eliminate the diversity of preferences and institutions and, and uh, cultures and histories, etc., uh, typical of, of, of Europe. So here, what, what seems uh, to be the case is that uh, uh, experimentalism may facilitate not only the development and revision of effective rules, where effective here means uniform, um, but also their acceptability. Uh, now, here I've put down a, a, few, a few points that are, are really preliminary thoughts. But on, on how and why this, this may be so. Uh, one reason uh, that, that may uh, support uh, the, the, uh, the legitimacy uh, role uh, uh, that, uh, or, or, or character of experimentalism is linked to the fact that uh, agreements are uh, reached through inclusive reviews. So uh, rules that are agree relatively uniform rules that are agreed at T1 are agreed on the basis of inclusive review and debate of actors' implementation experiences. A second reason uh, that may, may uh, support, uh, second, let's say, a mechanism that may support this, uh, this uh, legitimacy phase of experimentalism uh, is, uh, is that uh, uh, actually uniformity is a relative concept. So uh, I've been uh, uh, observing in, in my research that uh, no matter how uniform and harmonized and detailed rules uh, arrive to be, and, and you can trust me, the electricity regulations nowadays are very detailed, uh, etc. Um, there is always some space for diversity. Uh, either uh, either codified or not. And a third, a third uh, reason or underlying mechanism is that these rules uh, are also intentionally provisional. So actors know that the, the largely uniform rules they agree at T1 uh, will be revised at some point in time at T2. And this will be done once again through inclusive reviews and debates about their implementation experience. Okay, now my final slide looks uh, uh, at, uh, at the external dimension. And here the finding is that, uh, or the, the, let's say the most common finding across the six uh, subcases, um, is a combination of external differentiated integration with extended experimentalist governance. Um, I suspect that, uh, that again, uh, Dirk, uh, uh, Frank, and, and, and Bertold would, would uh, uh, explain uh, the external differentiated integration uh, by arguing that the pressure for uniformity due to interdependence has been traveling beyond the union's borders and this is why 
we have uh, uh, non-member states joining in and, and uh, uh, joining in in the sense of uh, oh, this is the wrong word but let's say uh, having uh, this is why we see these rules being applied also uh, to them uh, but we, what we also see is that uh, also experimentalist processes have been traveling uh, beyond the union and this is uh, the topic uh, discussed in in, uh, in Jonathan's uh, last book. So in conclusion uh, here what we may uh, start uh, thinking is that um, uh, the AI and experimentalist governance may seem uh, like alternatives within the EU but uh, Jonathan finds something different in, in finance but these two modes of governance they may be complement beyond uh, beyond the EU and with this I'll, I'll stop. Thanks a lot. Perfect, Bernardo. Many thanks also for sticking masterfully to the time. Uh, we will now hear um, the application of the experimentalist framework uh, to GMO regulation by Maria. Thank you, Sandra. I am sharing my screen. Can you now see my slides? Oh no, not yet. Now? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, good morning, everybody. It is uh, a pleasure to join this panel uh, today. I will be speaking about, as announced, EU regulation of agricultural biotechnology, uh, also known as genetically modified organisms. Indeed, as a case study, another case study in which we can observe some interesting interactions between uniform regulation on the one hand and experimentalist governance on the other hand, uh, as well as differentiated integration. And um, similar to what Bernardo was talking about, and I suspect to some extent also what, what Jonathan will be talking about, um, we can see that this is um, an area within internal market policy that um, is by no way depoliticized. Um, but let me first, um, sorry, um, how do I move forward on the, okay, so I'm trying to figure out how to switch to the next slide. You, you can use your, um your keyboard if, if you're having trouble with the mouse. Yeah, okay. Now, so before um, I go into detail, let me um, formulate the question that I'm going to raise today, um, which is what does the GMO example tell us about the relationship between experimentalism and differentiated integration as ways to accommodate diversity in the internal market? And uh, I won't be able to answer that question today, um, mainly because the paper that uh, we promised to write um, on this for the project, and uh, by we I'm referring to myself and my co-author Patricia dabrowska Kluzinska, uh, that paper has not yet been written. And a lot of what I'm going to say today is based on my book published last year on risk regulation and particular GMO regulation. Uh, but um, in this presentation and in the paper, we really need to uh, develop a new argument which juxtaposes uh, experimentalism and differentiated integration as concepts and so here further research and thinking is certainly needed so I'm looking forward to your to your feedback all right so uh, to start with as I said we are in the policy um, of the internal market and um, also here, um, the, uh, the, the example of and the history of GMO regulation um, um, contradicts the assumption that uh, the internal market is a policy area which is characterized by low politicization. So the GMO example is really quite um, striking. It, it, um, and I would say it also uh, goes for other areas of risk regulations. It's not just GMOs, it's uh, food safety, pesticides, chemicals. Um, 
areas in which we actually observe quite a number of multi-level conflicts over, over regulatory authority and the question of who has the final say on levels of protection and, and how we can accommodate national preferences and risk perceptions, etc. Um, and GMOs have been politicized already since the 1990s. Um, first time that the EU introduced harmonized rules in this area. Uh, and since then, we are seeing uh, quite persistent problems of implementation at the national level. Um, so politicization reveals itse itself in, um, in, in, in the fact that member states hold uh, quite polarized views about the safety of GMOs, uh, about their costs and benefits, uh, about the interests and values at stake in deciding about them, and there is um, a strong mobilization of a negative public opinion um, and civil society opinion uh, against GMOs. Um, there is also a heterogeneity with regard to uh, the agricultural conditions in the member states. So only a few member states actually embrace the kind of big scale monoculture type of agriculture that goes along with GMOs and only two not, not only two, but mostly two member states cultivate them uh, on a large scale, and that is Spain and Portugal and some other member states, but on a much smaller scale. And several reforms over the last um, almost 30 years have been enacted at the EU level to address these problems of politicization and implementation uh, problems. And what I'm trying to show in this talk mainly is that between 2001 and 2015, we see that these legal responses or regulatory responses at EU level were a combination of uh, centralizing the procedures and developing uniform, strict uniform standards, um, of high level of protection for public health and the environment. But at the same time, also here we see a, a layer of network governance and decentralized coordination within the implementation process. And that was um, uh, certainly aimed at ensuring that uh, member states will accept the final decisions and ensuring that they will have some say on, uh, on um, GMO risks and other issues in the authorization process. Yet this attempt to accommodate diversity within EU regulation has not worked very well. Um, particularly with regard to the process of authorization, we also have other rules concerning pre uh, post markets, uh, monitoring labeling, traceability, uh, traceability and coexistence, but I'm here mainly focusing on the problems with uh, within the authorization process itself. So in 2015, we see uh, a very interesting new development, and uh, this is where the concept of differentiated integration uh, comes into play. Uh, we see a step towards partial deharmonization in the area of GMO cultivation. So the EU deciding to give powers uh, back to the member states to decide on whether they want to cultivate or not. And that is something that I will go ahead and, and characterize as an atypical example of legislative differentiated disintegration to make the, the names even more complicated. So let me go <coughs> very quickly through the legal design and the, and, and the reasons why experimentalism hasn't worked well. And I would like to then mainly focus um, on the 2015 reform after that. So, as I said, we see, um, so the legislative framework uh, almost fully harmonizes all aspects of GMO um, cultivation and uh, placing on the market. And um, it introduces a pre-market authorization process. And here we see um, a complexity of a uh, procedural complexity of who is involved in, in participating in that process. So we have the European Food Safety Authority that is uh, carrying out a risk assessment, safety assessment, and then we have comitology rules involving member states in, in the decision on, on the final authorization. 
And um, of course, it is clear that these kind of processes are always needed in areas of high technical complexity, such as risk regulation, because the, the um, legislative provisions are really very um, um, broadly formulated. So in the case of GM authorization, we are looking at uh, um, the conditions to authorize are formulated as uh, they must not have adverse effects on human health, animal health or the environment. So that's, that's very broad. And so to know what this means in every case obviously requires that uh, you bring in scientific experts from different levels of uh, govern governance, you bring in um, the private applicant plays an important role in the process. And national authorities have a say uh, on the safety assessment. And to some extent, the, the broader public is supposed to be involved here as well. Uh, although we will see didn't, that didn't work so well. Um, and I will pick three examples of, of where experimentalism hasn't, hasn't worked. Um, we see overall in practice that decision-making on GMOs reverts to top-down decisions and the, the kind of uh, procedural channels uh, that should allow for input of other SOs are being, being um, um, yeah, circumvented or yeah, they, they're not being effective. Uh, EFSA is, like other EU agency, an example of a network agency. There is no uh, hierarchical position of uh, EFSA's decisions over national, over the advice of national authorities. Um, there, there are mechanisms uh, in the legal framework that, sh that ensure that EFSA uh, coordinates with um, national authorities, that they exchange views, that conflicts are mediated, that they share experiences, etc., etc. But mm, the high politicization in this area has put EFSA under pressure, and EFSA's response has been to, uh, to and it has been criticized for not engaging with member states views that were perhaps too critical and also not engaging with public views on, uh, on GMO risks. It also has done boundary work where certain issues were treated as non-scientific and therefore outside of the realm of its safety assessment. Another example is comitology, which we know is by design a deliberative uh, uh, forum. Um, Yet the situation in, with GMOs has been quite exceptional. Um, the, the procedural rules foresee that in order to either confirm or um, um, overrule the commission proposal to authorize, member states need to come up with a qualified majority and that has never been the case. However, what we have seen in every case was a simple majority against authorization. Yet because the procedural rules give the commission the power to, uh, uh, to decide in the end, the commission has always gone on to authorize despite a simple majority of member states. So that clearly shows us that the, the preferences of member states did not effectively translate into the decision in, in, in any kind of influence uh, over the decision-making process. And then I would like to stress that public participation has not been uh, effective and that is an issue of, uh, on the one hand, institutional design, but also of the mindset of, um, of, of the actors, mostly EFSA and the Commission, which were focused on a very narrow understanding of what safety uh, and scientific, relevant scientific evidence is. So the main takeaway from this then is that um, science has been used as the main response to politicization um, and that many concerns surrounding GMO, uh, yeah, the use of GMOs in food and agriculture have not been uh, included in, in the process and, and it, it was quite obvious for a long time that member states were not only concerned about safety narrowly defined but also concerned about agricultural sustainability, biodiversity, that ethical, Poland, Poland was one of the countries which had very strong ethical objections. So there was, um, it was clear that there is a misfit between what the EU is trying to uh, take it, well, what the EU is taking into account to decide on GMOs and what member states are actually concerned about. But yet there were no institutional channels to channel that, um, those views, those broader views uh, through the process. And that is also confirmed by an external evaluation, which I'm quoting here, but it says exactly, exactly that. 
Okay, so let me move on then to, to the year 2015, uh, where we, uh, where the um, EU legislature passes the new opt-out legislation, which ultimately uh, amends the legal framework, the Directive on uh, Deliberate Release of GMOs, and inserts uh, a provision there, which, um, what, which I argue ultimately um, should be seen as a partial deharmonization, to my knowledge, the first case of deharmonization in the field of the internal market where powers that were previously harmonized are being given back to member states. Uh, now that is, uh, that happens only, as I said, for GMO cultivation. So it's a limited deharmonization. And um, again, from a legal point of view, there could be other views and there's probably, there's been no court ruling on, on that. So there is no authoritative legal definition of what, what this uh, opt-out reform has achieved. But I argue in the book that we ultimately have to see it as deharmonization because member states are free to ban. They either don't have to provide reasons or have to provide reasons, but simply informing the commission. There's no mechanism to overrule their decisions or to control what they're doing. And ultimately they're released into the realm of free movement and when it comes to cultivation. Just briefly, what this opt-out clause does, it gives the member states the right, two kind of uh, possibilities to opt out. They can either do it ex ante, so before GMO is authorized, they can request that their territory uh, is exempted from the authorization um, decision. And the applicant company, the private applicant company has to agree to that. In that, can, in that case, uh, the territory is exempted. And the second possibility is an ex post unilateral uh, decision by the member state after the GMO is authorized to say, no, we're not going to cultivate it, we're opting out. And the legislation does say, thank you, Sandra, does say that they have to pursue a legitimate objective and they have to justify it as proportionate and non-discriminatory, which basically is the same um, this is the same situation that we have under the free movement rules, and I argue that this is merely a clarification of, of the free movement rules. But the um, uh, ultimately, member states uh, have the right to opt out from not from the whole legal framework, so not from the directive as such, but from one part of the directive, which is why it probably doesn't fall under the narrow definition of differentiated integration as we can find in the literature because it's defined as a legal, it has a legal definition and legislative differentiated integration is defined as an exemption from the whole legal act. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen here, but I would argue if we adopt a broader definition, for example, the one that uh, Sandra has presented yesterday, another understanding of differentiated that is broader than, than, than that does um, fit under this uh, concept. All right, so I will, uh, yeah, just briefly, the commission proposed to do the same opt-out for food and feed. So not just for cultivation, but food and feed, and that would have impacted strongly imports into the EU. And that proposal uh, got blocked in the legislative process. So that, that is not happening. And so uh, the opt-out is then confined to cultivation. And well, in terms of experience since the reform, I, I do not have a lot to report. We still have to do a lot of research on that. But let me tell you that 19 out of 28 member states have used the opt-out, all of them ex ante in, uh, with the consent of the applicant. And the reasons have been, um, there's a variety of reasons, green image, distrust, uh, public opinion, uh, environmental concerns. Um, and what we, well, what we see um, in one case in Germany, for example, is that the implementation of the opt-out reform has actually triggered a new um, uh, sort of multi-level conflict within the federal state of Germany, where then the, the same situation, the same uh, dispute continues and the federal level um, is, is arguing with the uh, German lender over who is then supposed to I, I ultimately opt out. So it, it kind of, the differentiation might continue also um, at the national level within federal states. Um, 
Now, what we need to look at in the future is to what extent has this um, opt-out reform actually impacted the, uh, um, the, the authorization process and the legal framework um, at the EU level. Because one of the arguments for the Commission to enact this reform was, well, it will actually allow us to work more effectively at the EU level because member states will be able to opt out, but they can at least agree to the authorization at the uh, at the EU level, and then um, you know that will improve free movement. The experience so far, from what I know, the limited things that I have seen, uh, points to the opposite. There, uh, we still have deadlock in comitology in 2017 there was a vote on two new crop varieties which uh, again uh, found a majority of member states being against it so in that sense then uh, de facto we don't have a differentiation if at the EU level uh, products are still not uh, being authorized and um, right so I'll move on to to reflections which, which will be also my conclusion. Thanks, Sandra, I think I'm running out of time. Um, so on why this form of differentiated disintegration occur, well, as I said, it's not, it's atypical because it's not uh, in the context of enlargement. This is what, you know, differentiated integration scholarship has argued that within the internal market, we mainly see uh, these forms of differentiated in the context of enlargement. But it was actually due to the wish on the one hand to improve the, the centralized procedure at the EU level on the one hand, but it was also motivated by the wish to shift the blame on GMO decisions. And that's very interesting. So the commission at some point was just not happy that it had to take these decisions. It felt it had to, and it was constantly criticized and there was so much resistance from the member states. And so now we see this blame shifting games continue within, within federal states. Well, at least within Germany, there's some um, literature on that by now. Um, and also interesting, actually the reform legally formalized uh, differentiation that already took place de facto before because member states have refused to implement EU decisions. And some last reflections on effectiveness and legitimacy of both experimentalism and, um, and differentiated integration. Well, and I understand this to be in relation to the question uh, in how far both are able to combine the pursuit of common goals with the accommodation of difference. Well, I think that experimentalism clearly scores better on that because it, it does strive to accommodate difference while pursuing common goals. So it does strive to do that in areas which are highly integrated, but it recognizes the need for diversity and, and, and uh, in the implementation process. And in, particularly in areas of high scientific complexity, I think that the need for flexibility in experimental structures is, is clearly there. But what, I have, what we can observe in this particular case is on the one hand, we can question to what extent experimentalism is able to overcome this very highly technocratic framings of, uh, of risk regulation. And to what extent is it able to bring in voices that would counter very narrow understandings of risk and technology. And um, one reason for why perhaps experimentalism wasn't able to address politicization well within GMO regulation was also because the, the substantive scope of acceptable arguments was limited. So there were perhaps, you know, procedures to bring in different actors, but there, there was no acceptance of arguments which went beyond, beyond a very certain framing of GMO risks and a broader understanding of GMOs as actually a cross-sectoral issue, which affects food production and sustainability and agricultural production, land use. So all that, you know, didn't count as an acceptable argument in the conversation. Um, so when experimentalism fails to address politicization in this way, I think that the kind of examples of differentiated integration that I've shown with the 2015 reform, that can be an effective uh, way forward. But Ultimately, it sacrifices common objectives such as internal market integrity, but also the objective that we do need to also at the EU level to agree on the appropriate framing of what GMOs are about. And, and that is also being sacrificed because basically the massive politics are being uh, de delegated to the national level. Overall, I think that 
still GMO, th this example of differentiated disintegration is quite exceptional. It has happened in a, in a very limited field where you could argue that interdependence is weaker with cultivation than it is with food and feed, clearly because of, um, of the widespread use of food and feed by European farmers. And um, well, I will conclude by saying that perhaps um, this reform basically should be seen as a correction of an integration process that went too far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. I think uh, it is important to look in fact at the details for these processes of, of experimentalism and differentiation. So the case studies are certainly extremely rich uh, that you are presenting and uh, I look forward now to the case study on finance by Jonathan. You need to unmute your uh, microphone. Sorry, I didn't realize I, had, I was muted. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so I'm going to do two things. First, I'm going to present in a very quick and synthetic way the research uh, that I, we are doing on experimentalism and differentiation and financial regulation, focusing on the single supervisory mechanism for banking union. And then I'll present some uh, quick comparative conclusions across the three uh, cases. And of course, those are fairly preliminary. So uh, the first thing is just to underline the significance of this, uh, this case. Um, banking union, I think, is widely and rightly considered to be uh, the most important step towards further European integration since the creation of the euro. Uh, it's clearly a form of differentiated integration although it is nested within the single market and EU-wide financial uh, regulation. But uh, within the banking union, it also faces uh, significant challenges of diversity across participating member states. And that's something that's very important to keep in mind. And we see it also within the Eurozone uh, more generally, or indeed within uh, Schengen, just because some member states uh, opt out or excluded from a given policy field doesn't mean that there isn't still quite a lot of diversity that is a challenge uh, for regulation. Um, the SSM is widely considered to mark a decisive step towards uh, supranationalization of EU financial regulation. It's clearly more centralized and more hierarchical, at least on paper, than the European supervisory authorities, the three uh, sectoral authorities for banking, uh, for um, securities and capital markets, and for um, insurance and occupational pensions. And so you could ask, okay, does this mark a clear break with experimentalism uh, in financial regulation, which I and others have argued uh, has been important uh, in the past, at least since the Lampalusi process at the beginning? of the 2000s. So I want to present um, a, a number of different uh, views of um, the SSM. Um, maybe if, if you're familiar with um, the famous film Rashomon, um, where there are, are different views of, of an event, you, I, I, we could take some uh, inspiration here. Um, so first I want to present it as a centralized hierarchy. Uh, it's a single supervise, supranational supervisor for Eurozone banks, and it has final authority over granting and withdrawing banking licenses. That's the power of life and death over banks. That's very important. It directly supervises the 125 largest or most significant banks in the Eurozone, and it can take over supervision of so-called less significant institutions from the national competent authorities, or NCAs, where necessary. It's produced a harmonized supervisory manual of methodologies and procedures, which is very detailed and prescriptive, runs to more than a thousand uh, pages. And um, the SSM, in its own words, um, undertakes intrusive hands-on oversight of significant uh, financial institutions by joint supervisory teams or JSTs of uh, supervisors from the ECB and the national authorities, 
This is supported uh, by on-site inspection missions, and the JSTs and the on-site inspections work together with central benchmarking and review by the uh, horizontal services of the SSM located within the European Central Bank. Now, here's another view of the, uh, the SSM, which I think is also quite persuasive, the SSM as a polyarchic network. If you look at the decision-making process, all the major decisions must be approved by the supervisory board, and there the NCAs have 19 of the 25 votes. If we look also organizationally, the ECB doesn't directly employ or control the NCA staff uh, involved in on-site and off-site banking supervision through the JSTs and the on-site inspection uh, missions. And uh, you know there are a thousand people involved, uh, employed directly by the ECB banking supervision, but there are probably nine or ten times as many people. Uh, involved in actual banking supervision uh, in, the e, in, in, in the banking union. Uh, the NCAs retain an independent voice on EU financial rulemaking through the European Banking Authority, and there there are double majority voting arrangements to safeguard uh, the interests of non-banking union member states. And you can say, paradoxically, that um, the EBA and the Commission are the uh, financial regulators, and uh, the SSM, the ECB, is a, a, a supervisor which applies those regulations. And this institutional design arguably encourages a cooperative rather than a hierarchical approach by the ECB to joint supervision with uh, the NCAs. So I've done now quite a few interviews with NCAs, but also within the ECB, and there is uh, quite a lot of um, consensus that that's how it actually worked. Okay, so the SSM uh, as a polyarchic network, but how far can this be considered a case of experimentalist governance? And I want first to acknowledge some limitations. Uh, clearly, uh, the SSM diverges from the classic four-stage experimentalist governance architecture that I presented at the beginning and that Bernardo also discussed in a number of important respects. Uh, rather than setting open-ended framework goals and giving low, lower level actors substantial autonomy to pursue them in ways uh, adapted to their own local circumstances, the SSM has developed increasingly detailed prescriptive rules and methods which banking supervisors are expected to apply as consistently as possible across national jurisdictions. And why is this? Well, there are some very good reasons for it. Uh, it's intended to, first of all, remove national barriers to integration of banking markets across the Eurozone. Secondly, reduce opportunities for regulatory arbitrage, which have always been very important in finance. And uh, thirdly, to ensure that Eurozone banks are treated fairly, uh, that there's equality of treatment and a level playing field. But I would argue that beneath the hierarchical veneer of the SSM, we see uh, a flourishing of uh, experimentalist practices. First of all, uh, the SSM does not, uh, very explicitly doesn't seek to impose uh, a one size fits all approach to supervision or to hom homogenize banks' business models. Uh, instead, it aims explicitly to accommodate banking diversity by tailoring common rules and methods to firm specificities. And it try, in doing so, it tries to combine the deep knowledge of national supervisors about individual banks and national markets with the uh, ECB's broad comparative experience. And the core idea here is to treat similar institutions similarly and different institutions differently across the banking union uh, irrespective of, uh, of national origin. And actually, the ECB has just reorganized its banking supervision um, around uh, three uh, directorates for banks with different kinds of business models. Um, secondly, the development of the joint supervisory teams uh, has been a very intensive process of cross-fertilization and mutual learning 
among supervisors from different national systems. And the whole thing works through integrating bottom-up information about firms specific risk profiles into the annual supervisory review and evaluation process, the SREP, which is then in turn compared and benchmarked uh, by ECB banking supervision. The SSM manual has been co-developed by the ECB and the NCAs uh, explicitly as a living document subject to continuous uh, review and improvements with regular input from frontline supervisors. Um, and we find that there is um, a, a plethora of uh, peer review and joint policy development within and between the JSTs, the on-site inspectors, and the ECB horizontal networks. Um, we also find experimentalist practices of comparative review and continuous uh, improvement further developed through a kind of second line supervisory quality insurance, uh, assurance unit, uh, which uh, does, um, uh, it, it does anonymized uh, peer reviews of the workings of the JSTs and the horizontal uh, divisions. And it then, um, oops, uh, it, it then proposes so-called uh, improvement proposals for, for improvement. All of these are aimed to combine a high level of consistency and harmonization of practice at any given time uh, with systematic comparisons of experience in different local contexts and regular revisions of methods and policies uh, in light of that experience. And here I will show you uh, a little diagram from the, uh, the public version of the SSM uh, manual where you can see this kind of, uh, uh, of, of cycle of uh, policies, methods, implementations, uh, review and uh, revision uh, feeding back into the, uh, the, the supervisory policies and rules uh, themselves. Um, and I think the, uh, I hope that the affinity with the experimentalist cycle, even in its full form, will be relatively clear. Okay, now I want to move from my own uh, research to uh, some comparative uh, conclusions. So first of all, I want to argue that the cases of energy or ele electricity and financial regulation provide provisional support for the view that experimentalist governance uh, arrangements based on network European agencies uh, like those in uh, energy, the uh, Agency for the Cooperation of European Energy Regulators and the European Banking Authority represent a promising response to the challenge of accommodating diversity and preferences, of preferences and conditions among EU member states within increasingly integrated markets. Secondly, I think that the case of the SSM shows that experimentalist practices may flourish even within apparently hierarchical and centralized formal arrangements uh, in response to the functional challenges of combining central coordination with local knowledge under conditions of deep diversity and strategic uncertainty. And that's also a methodological point uh, that we really have to study these kinds of arrangements uh, in action and not just on paper. Thirdly, the case of banking regulation and supervision shows that experimentalist governance can coexist with uh, differentiated integration, and it can provide a framework for accommodating and learning from diversity within as well as between uh, separate groups of member states. So the uh, Eurozone ins and outs, and the interface between the SSM and the European Banking Authority. So in that case, we could say, Yes, um, experimentalist governance is a complement uh, to differentiated integration. It may even be necessary for differentiated integration to function uh, well. Fourthly, the cases of banking and electricity regulation also support the view that under conditions of high interdependence, what we can call tight coupling, or what uh, Frank Schimmelfenig um, and uh, Winson uh, in, their, in their new book, Ever Looser Union, talk about in terms of high externalities, uh, harmonized rules and supervisory practices can be effective and acceptable to member states, 
provided that they're applied in a contextually sensitive way and revised regularly on the basis of local uh, implementation experience. I would say in finance as well as in, in electricity, we see this kind of cascade uh, of, uh, of rules, of um, uh, norms, of guidances, and so on, uh, which provide more and more room for diversity as they become, uh, they come closer to the points of implementation and as they move uh, also from the realm of uh, so-called hard law uh, into soft forms of guidance. And here, and this may be really uh, an important lesson of, uh, of this work package for studying uh, integration and regulation in the EU, it can be that diachronic experimentalism uh, may be a condition for synchronic uh, uniformity of regulation uh, within the EU. And finally, some remarks about the case of uh, GMO authorization. So on the one hand, I think this shows that hierarchical decision-making procedures uh, can block experimentalist uh, deliberation. I would emphasize the kinds of problems that um, uh, Maria drew attention to, of the kind of range of issues that are allowed to be taken into account within the authorization process, which short circuit uh, experimentalist deliberation. But uh, these hierarchical decision-making procedures are not necessarily more effective at overcoming opposition from member states rooted in diversity of preferences and conditions. So this has really been a, you know, one of the cases of, of effective non-compliance with, uh, with EU centralized regulation. Finally, GMO authorization also shows that differentiated integration or what um, Maria is calling differentiated uh, disintegration in the sense of returning decision-making powers to member states can be a potentially effective response to diversity where functional interdependence between member states is weak, as in the case of, of cultivation. Um, excuse me, my mouse is hypersensitive. Um, but not where this interdependence is strong and uh, where differentiation would undermine the functioning of the internal market. And they are the contrast with the rejection of um, disintegration for the use of GMOs for food and feed is relevant. It could be <coughs> that we can explain this in terms of loose versus tight coupling or low versus high externalities. I still want to, to raise some unresolved uh, questions for the empirical research. First of all, as Maria points out, we don't know really whether opt-outs will allow extension of GMO cultivation by willing member states. The first results are not encouraging there. So in that sense, it could be that even uh, differentiated disintegration is not a substitute for being able to reach uh, commonly agreed rules through experimentalist uh, deliberation. And secondly, um, we now have new plant breeding uh, technologies uh, like CRISPR, which don't involve actually moving uh, RNA from one plant to, to another, and they can't be traced with the standard mechanisms for tracing um, GMOs. And the question is whether these will be exempted from the GMO authorization process. The European Court of Justice ruled uh, no, that they fall under the, um, uh, the, the heading of the same rules as GMOs. However, uh, 14 member states have asked the commission to come up with, uh, with propose, to do a review and come up with proposals uh, for legislatively differentiating these new plant breeding technologies from GMO authorization uh, rules. So I think we, we can say that uh, rather than really defusing the debate about um, GMOs, this um, uh, differentiated disintegration uh, you know, may itself uh, be, be pushed aside by a new wave of politicized debate uh, about uh, post-GMO uh, plant breeding technologies. Thanks.
Thanks a lot, uh, Jonathan, and in fact, uh, all the speakers. Uh, this um, is fascinating research and uh, extremely rich uh, case studies uh, with deep knowledge of uh, the workings of uh, policy making uh, and differentiation also in these policy fields. I think this is uh, much needed and also very insightful. Uh, because it engages seriously with the modes of governance uh, in, in the European system. And um, your approach is able to, to highlight the interplay between uh, the properties of the, the laws, of the regulations of the EU, of the policies on the one hand, and the features of the organizational process uh, and institutions whereby um, these rules are produced. So. Um, it really uh, enhances uh, the understanding of how differentiation or, or flexibility um, works in practice. Um, yeah, I, I like to make this uh, distinction between the regulatory dimension of differentiation and, and the organizational dimension of, of differentiation. So I would uh, like to kick off the discussion with two questions um, to all the panelists, one on the uh, organizational dimension and one on, on the regulatory dimension of, let's say, experimentalism and differentiation. Um, so on the organizational uh, dimension, experimentalist governance um, and regulation in the fields that you are studying takes place in quite technocratic bodies, right? Uh, there's a high presence of, 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 of regulatory actors, um, which are uh, also organized as networks in, in, in comitology committees or in, in regulatory agencies. The commission also plays, plays an important role. Um, and these are also the places where much of the experimentalist process takes place. And uh, maybe my question is, is at the theoretical level um, on the link between experimentalism and deliberative theory uh, in, in the sense of the democratic um, aspects of, of experimentalist governance. But more generally, um, I think um, the question of the inclusivity and the uh, capacity of um, these organizational bodies to um, process um, the, the, the idea of experimentalist governance uh, can be looked at a bit more, more closely or maybe a, a bit more critically. Um, I was reminded a little bit of uh, what John Eric Fossum was uh, saying uh, yesterday in the first panel about the EU system uh, and organizational setup producing also certain world views. Uh, certain ways of, of doing things and, and uh, Maria, your presentation was quite explicit on uh, the comatology procedure, although being open in mind, uh, in, in fact is not because it does not accept certain arguments, but perhaps also certain, uh, the channels are maybe not so, so well developed uh, that could bring together the different views that contribute to the politicization and the stalemate in this area. So my, my first question is, um, does the EU organizational setup of uh, policy making in your sectors uh, really live up to the ideas of experimentalism in terms of bringing together different views and how, how could it be made, more, who could it be improved, right? Where do you see the scope for improvement? Is it more through national control of these actors and national deliberation or um, in, in the supranational dimension. And, and the second question um, links back to the title of, of the panel, uh, Experimentalism and Differentiated Integration as Alternatives or Complements. Um, I was a bit surprised by this opposition and juxtaposition because um, in my eyes, experimentalism is, is already a way to, to differentiate. Um, and I think, um, but maybe uh, you see differently, but I think that the very rigid definition of differentiated integration is focused on official formal opt-outs or opt-ins from relatively centralized formal law, right, without 
a more nuanced uh, and differentiated notion of what law is, uh, brings you to, to put the opposition between the two. But if you accept that um, EU regulations uh, have a wide, wide variety of degrees of legalization, um, then uh, I think the, the alternative uh, picture of, of experimentalism as an alternative to differentiated integration does not bring so much, right? It, 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 it fades away if you take a more nuanced view on, on what law in the EU is and how it works. So this would be my uh, question to keep off. And I also look at the Q&A uh, button of Zoom, but uh, actually there's no open question. Um, I invite the public to please post your questions and we will address them uh, after this first round of answers. Yes, maybe um, we, we start with Jonathan again. Or? Um, I, I suggest actually uh, you, you start with uh, with Bernardo and Maria, and then I come back to, okay. to the, the more general questions as well yeah. as on finance. And there were also a couple of uh, questions that I answered in the in the Q and A in written form. But if there's time, I could uh, I could uh, come back on those because I think they are quite interesting and could be shared. I don't know if you can see them uh, there in the answered. Uh, Yeah, so Sandra, if you look in the answered um, questions, um, then you... Yeah, I see, uh, I see two. Okay, so um, Patricia Dabrowska um, uh, to Bernardo says that it's a very interesting presentation and the question is, why is it so surprising that there is a combination of uniform rules and experimentalist governance? Um, and uh, Neil Mortimer, also to Bernardo, asked uh, for your view on Brexit and how um, the interplay between differentiated integration and experimentalism may actually uh, play out for the role of the UK uh, between the internal and the external dimension of differentiation. So maybe I can just uh, discuss very briefly these two and then... And then. So on, on basically uh, to Patricia, I mean, I gave a, a written a written reply here, but uh, let me let me illustrate with an example. You know, this there is the, a case in electricity, which is about uh, network access regulation, which is crucial because uh, uh, it's crucial in order to promote competition, in order to promote an integrated internal market. And there we saw that uh, uh, actors in the late uh, 1990s, they started uh, discussing, sharing their experiences, uh, and they came uh, to a first agreement, which was about uh, uh, market-based uh, access as opposed to first come, first serve. Uh, but then, uh, so this, this uh, led to a first agreement. But then new questions emerged, you know, so, okay, what kind of market-based uh, arrangement to use? And then they started comparing different uh, approaches and experiences with different types of options. And a few years later, they decided, okay, let's go for implicit auctions rather than explicit auctions. But then again, other questions emerged and, and so on and so forth. So, so what happened through these uh, cycles, let's say, is that uh, rules became uh, increasingly more detailed. Uh, and this, uh, I mean, we see that in, in many other sectors, if we compare the regulation we had 20 years ago to the kind of regulation we have, we have now. Um, but the process to do so was experimentalist, I, I argue, uh, so based on comparisons and debates about these different implementation experiences. So it is surprising because we, we uh, tend to think about experimentalism as, uh, in the current conceptions, as uh, uh, as formed by broad frameworks, discretion, and then uh, review, reviews and revisions. But the first two steps here uh, seem to be uh, compressing more and more. Um, and when we think about uniformity, we tend to think about hierarchical governance, so top-down imposition of uniform stable rules. And, and what, what it seems to be, to be emerging is a combination of uniformity but also revisability. Uh, and this is, this is why I think it's, it's quite interesting. 
And on 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 Neil's question, I I yeah, I think I mean it sounds as a as a good idea. Uh, so basically, I mean the UK uh, in energy, but also in financial regulation and in many other sectors has been um, has been playing a very influential role in the development of of rules. Um, and many have been learning from 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 the UK. Uh, now that is going to be outside. Uh, yes, we can, we could imagine that. Uh, that uh, uh, it could still play a role in the development and application of of, uh, of these rules. Um, no. Yes, so I, Maria. I yes, please. Now, maybe also. Yeah. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for your thoughtful comments and and questions. I think you've put your finger. Uh, right on the on the sore spot, so to say. In a way, I do think that <clears throat> my case study, but it's not the only uh, you know example, of course, shows clearly that there is a, a different uh, dimension to diversity, which is epistemic diversity. And I'm not sure that within the internal market framework, both institutional and legal, the EU is very good at accommodating epistemic diversity. Well, at least that is the lesson I have taken from, from, the, from the case of agricultural biotech. Now, what I mean by it is precisely what you are pointing to, and I, uh, to go back to the, to the way you started your question is, you know, what is the relationship to deliberative democratic deliberative theory and I'll, I'll let Jonathan explain the more perhaps uh, theoretical relationship but I, I, in my understanding there is a very uh, strong relationship with it and I do think that experimentalism is inspired by deliberative uh, democracy to the extent that it uh, as an in, in its ideal form, um, it, it is about involving a broad range of actors and not only uh, technocratic actors, but in fact allow different kind of voices and perspectives that are relevant to a problem. And certainly the problem of GMOs, there uh, there is a, a, a much broader range of voices that is relevant to the question of whether we want them or not. And I'm not saying we shouldn't want them. I'm not per se against GMOs, but I'm saying that we need to have a, a discussion which, which ultimately is much broader than the kind of discussion that the EU would like to have about that for different reasons, for reasons that have to do with um, uh, internal market integration as a, as a, as a, as a fundamental goal, uh, also has to do with political legitimacy. Um, the Commission never felt comfortable enough as an actor to and didn't feel uh, having the political authority to engage in this kind of conversation. So um, perhaps to summarize, I think there is um, a variety of reasons which leads to the narrowing down of, of epi the epistemic underpinnings of these kind of processes. And uh, I would also be curious to hear what John, uh, John Eric has to say about this because I see a link to his presentation yesterday. Um, so I think the variety of reasons and I'd like to emphasize one would be uh, the primacy of internal market integration and a certain, you know, the need to impose certain disciplines here. And of course it's fundamental and non-discrimination and all that. Um, and there is a problem there because a lot of, Objections to GMOs have to do with socioeconomic factors as well. So the economy is part of it. Um, and the second reason would be an institutional um, reason, which has to do with the question of who, who are the actors who can bring in different voices into the conversation. And perhaps delegating the process to a highly technocratic, expert-based body like the Commission is not the best way to deal with this in these kind of highly politicized cases, you know. Not saying that generally we should exclude the Commission from implementation of EU legislation, but there, there must be mechanisms which divert these kind of uh, problems to a forum which has the political legitimacy to to address it. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. So um, we will give the floor to Jonathan. Um, there has uh, as a last question has entered the Q and A. Can you see Jonathan? Um, yeah, I can see that. I will, yeah. I will take that up, and maybe I say yeah. a word also 
uh, in response to Neil's uh, question. But first, yeah, I, and I would like to, um, because I've seen that John Eric is actually in the um, in the group uh, of participants. I think he cannot take uh, the microphone himself, but maybe you could write uh, your thoughts, John Eric, into um, in, into this Q and A uh, function. Uh, that would be quite valuable. Uh, if, if you don't mind. Um, and in the meantime, yes, Jonathan, please. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. Thanks for these uh, excellent uh, questions. So um, the, the link to deliberative theory, and of course I agree with um, uh, um, Maria that experimentalism is inspired by and embraces um, deliberative democratic theory with perhaps two qualifications. One is a focus on practical deliberation. So uh, really deliberation uh, on, the, on the basis of um, uh, practical proposals and um, comparative review of um, implementation uh, experiences. And secondly, uh, compared to um, uh, Habermasian conception of deliberation there is not the assumption that there is one rational answer that everybody could be expected to agree to. I mean, you might reach a, a provisional consensus but itself requiring further uh, elaboration uh, through um, application and, and review and so on. So no, no reflective uh, equilibrium. But the question of who participates and how and with what consequences in terms of the, the realm of debate is an important one. Of course, it varies uh, significantly across different uh, policy fields, both for reasons which have to do with the nature of the policy field, but also to do with the specific institutional arrangements in the EU uh, within which uh, policy uh, is made. So um, certainly within the SSM, I, I see you know, really a remarkable uh, amount of, uh, of deliberation, of comparison, of experience uh, across uh, countries, uh, across different levels, across uh, different uh, functions. And I think that does keep uh, a debate open and prevents a sort of uh, ossification. Um, I think it's also worth emphasizing and here, I would, would probably disagree very strongly with, uh, with John Eric, that I, I don't see a kind of um, you know, narrowing down into a particular uh, worldview. In, in fact, I think we should not understate the, the revolution in the approach to uh, financial regulation, especially banking supervision that has, has followed the financial crisis and of which the, uh, the single supervisory mechanism is a really a uh, good example, the intrusive hands-on uh, regulation, promoting diversity of banking uh, models, uh, challenging banks systematically in terms of their own internal models uh, and, and processes. So I think that's, that's very significant. Then the question is, what about other stakeholders? Uh, and there in financial regulation uh, more broadly, we do see and openness to other stakeholders. There is certainly regular consultation of regu regulated entities, the banks themselves. One of the strengths of the SSM is it uh, is less captured by uh, the interests and preoccupations of financial institutions than in the past. And I would say more generally, the EU has in the wake of the financial crisis, tried to open up the, uh, the debate about financial regulation to a wider range uh, of actors. And the problem is that this is an area, unlike GMOs, for instance, where civil society has not been so active, but um, the, uh, the EU has been funding uh, counter expertise on finance, such as uh, uh, Finance Watch uh, EU. And when Michelle Barnier was, um, commissioner for uh, finance, uh, he deliberately opened up the expert groups advising the commission to ensure that there would be more participation by alternative voices. Finance is a hard case. Um, I mean, GMOs is in, in a way uh, an easier 
case. And there, maybe I have a slight disagreement or difference of emphasis with uh, Maria, because I tend to think that um, uh, the problems in the GMO area are not intrinsic to the regulation of the internal market, uh, but could uh, relatively easily be resolved by uh, changes in interpretation and procedures. And I also think, and I think this is the message of her work, that um, the EU will not be able to deal successfully with these kinds of issues until it is willing to open up the, uh, the debate to consider other uh, kinds of, uh, of concerns uh, in, thing, in the regulation of new technologies and agriculture. And, I mean, maybe uh, uh, Bernardo can uh, pass, can say a word about the situation uh, in energy where the Florence and Madrid fora, which are multi-stakeholder fora, um, which also include representatives of users and consumers, have played a very important part uh, in regulation. Okay, let me, I'll be briefer about the other uh, questions. Um, so why do I um, distinguish, why do I say experimentalism, experimentalist governance is an alternative to differentiated integration? And here we can look forward, we can look back to the discussion in the first panel about um, the problems of, of differentiated integration in the narrow sense of policy fields that um, uh, include or exclude some groups of, uh, of member states and their potential for domination and other uh, problems. And uh, we, uh, John Eric and uh, Richard Bellamy will be debating uh, the normative uh, questions about um, DI th this afternoon. I tend to be pretty negative about DI insofar as there is a genuine problem of accommodating diversity. I think experimentalism can be an alternative way of, uh, of doing that. That's why I pose them as uh, in, in that way in the, in the work package. And what we find in a way is that even if you would have differentiated integration in, in the classic sense, in policy fields like the Euro or Schengen, where you, there is a binary choice to be in or out, it doesn't solve the problem of accommodating diversity and therefore you still need experimentalism uh, as a, a, a complement. So let me take um, the, uh, the question uh, from, uh, let me see if I can see it, from um, uh, Xing Yu uh, Zhou, who by the way is, is going to be a, a visiting PhD student in, uh, in Amsterdam in 20, 21. She, she asks, when encountering emergencies such as the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's EU governance still needs uniform regulation to ensure the efficiency of policymaking. I'm wondering whether it's possible to coordinate the relationship of experimentalist and uniform regulation and construct a dual track governance model um, uh, for um, conventional governance with experimentalism and emergency management for uniform regulation to adapt to the increasingly complex uh, governance uh, context. Now, of course, here we have the problem that the EU's powers and regulatory framework in the area of public health um, has been very minimal. So we basically had an uncoordinated response, which the EU is now trying to build up mechanisms uh, for, uh, for coordination. But we can think about uh, emergency policy making and uh, ordinary policy making um, in terms of, let's say, the relationship between um, firefighting and building up a, uh, a fire prevention uh, apparatus. And so uh, when you have an emergency, you may have to act in a, a more centralized hierarchical way. We saw some of that uh, in the, uh, the Euro crisis. But if you want uh, to prevent, or, or in, in financial regulation in relation to the, the global financial crisis, but if you want to build up the capacities uh, to, uh, to prevent crises from coming in the future, then arguably you do need an experimentalist framework. And then it's open to question whether the rules have to be 
uh, uniform at a given moment or whether they can also allow uh, some, some significant uh, diversity um, at the level of the, the participating units. I've gone on for quite a while, so I think I will, I will stop there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jonathan. Um, our time would have now been uh, over. Um, it's, it's five past twelve, but I propose that we stay a little bit uh, because, Bernardo, you may want to address Jonathan's question about the electricity market. And we also have John Eric, who has been given, I think, by the administrators the um, access uh, to, 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 to the group of uh, speakers. Um, so my, my proposal would be that those who still have time and, and uh, want to stay uh, on, uh, we stay a little bit uh, in our conversation. And those who have to leave, of course, please feel free to leave. So um, Bernardo, you want to start and then we will pass the word to John Eric. Yeah, I mean, just just very briefly, uh, I mean, as uh, as Jonathan mentioned, so in, in electricity and also in gas, you have this, uh, we have this uh, uh, regulatory forums the, called respectively Florence Forum and Madrid Forum. They are quite inclusive in the sense that they bring together representatives of, of uh, producers, of traders, of distributors, uh, and also consumers organizations and um, regulators, member states, and so on. Uh, and they've been playing quite an important role. Uh, at least that's my, that's, that's my view. I mean, somebody can also be very dismissive. That said, I think, Sandra, your, your question is very, is very good. And I don't think there's, a, there's an easy reply to that, because we see in the early work by, by, by Chuck Sable, uh, he Basically, what he's arguing about, about on this dimension is uh, that uh, experimentalism is normatively promising, but this doesn't guarantee uh, good results, meaning that, uh, at least in my, in my understanding, so meaning that uh, this is a form of governance which, uh, in principle, can uh, increase participation. But of course, it can also be, this can also lead to unintended consequences and to new forms of uh, hidden, 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 agenda, hidden agenda, and so on and so forth. Um, but in the, at least in, the, in its uh, aspiration, uh, I mean, that, that would be, there would be an aspiration to, to increase and extend participation to all uh, affected actors. Um, Okay. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, very interesting uh, answer. Um, I, I'm not sure actually whether John Eric is, is really there or whether it's just um, um, his name popping up. So uh, I think we, we should not wait for him. Um, Maybe Jonathan, would you uh, like to make a final comment? I mean, on my side, uh, I, I must say uh, I'm pretty convinced. Um, I would maybe, uh, I, I think experimentalism is, is, a, is a theory which is quite thick and has quite some presuppositions. Um, and it's not, it's not a empirical, uh, concept where you would measure, for example, how open is the aki for internal diversity or how um, inclusive is the organizational process in, well, uh, may maybe, maybe that there could be this, this additional round of, of uh, operationalizations to, um, to break it down uh, in, in, into, into clearly observable uh, or, or comparable um, dimensions. Maybe this is, is something that it, it, it is somewhere in between grand theory, deliberative theory and so on, and, and more empirical down to earth research. And, and maybe there's a little bit um, in between that can be, um, can be developed. Uh, yeah, um, but, but it's certainly extremely promising. Um, 
And I think it's also uh, important to, to be able to say wh where it stops, right? Um, and, and I think you are at, at on this agenda that, that you can say, well, this is um, still in, uh, experimentalism and, and, and this is differentiation or something else. So uh, I think this is very important too. Oh, thanks for, for the, the comment, um, Sandra. Um, let me just make two very quick uh, responses. One is to say that I encourage people to look at um, some of uh, Bernardo's uh, other published work because he tries, he has some operationalizations um, uh, which are more specific to try to look at the relation between experimentalist architectures and whether they are actually applied in, in experimentalist uh, ways and distinguishing, contrasting them to hierarchical governance. Uh, for myself, I, I mean, I think it's important to um, emphasize that there are three uh, complementary dimensions of experimentalism uh, for, as a research agenda and theoretical perspective. So there is uh, experimentalism as a kind of um, uh, theoretical ideal type, so a, a governance architecture which has certain scope conditions and under those conditions can produce certain, can work in a certain way and produce certain kinds of, uh, of results. Secondly, there's the empirical study of actually existing forms of governance uh, in which the question can be, um, you know, to what extent are they experimentalists? And insofar as they're experimentalists, do they work in the way that the theory suggests? And then the third dimension, this is, this is quite important, is the, the normative and diagnostic dimension. So to the extent that we see, let us say, a gap between the way a given form of governance uh, works in, in practice and the model, I mean, that can be, um, a reason to revise or refine the model, and we're doing that a bit uh, in, in this work package, but it can also be uh, an argument uh, why uh, certain problems observed in the actual functioning of a given set of governance arrangements could be addressed by making them more experimentalist. And I would say the opening up of, uh, of deliberation in the GMO authorization regime would, would be an example of that. So that would be an experimentalist critique of the existing uh, regime. Um, so I think you know, this is a kind of pragmatist approach to, to theory and, and research in which theoretical concepts, uh, normative perspectives and empirical research are, are mutually reinforcing in the dialogue uh, with one another, as opposed to being, you know, completely separate from one another in a Sartorian uh, positivist uh, model. So that, that that's how I would sort of explain some of the uh, maybe the, the the paradoxes that you point out um, in the experimentalist research program. Yes, it's very convincing and. Uh... So uh, keeping you busy for, <laughs> I think, <laughs> some more time and, and more publications to come up uh, using this framework uh, fruitfully in these different dimensions. Um, so uh, I think we, we can now conclude the session. Um, I would to thank the panelists again for this insights you gave us into your really exciting and extremely rich research uh, that will certainly also become uh, a reference uh, for uh, future studies on uh, governance and differentiation in these policy fields, uh, but also for theory building, um, clearly. And uh, thanks for the um, audience also who has joined and the conference continues this afternoon. I think it's uh, one thirty, right? The Actually, it is at two thirty. Good to ah, two thirty, right? By yes. that, that was a mistake between uh, London time and Amsterdam time. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So there's a orderly lunch break in between. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hope to see many of you uh, this afternoon, also this evening for the final uh, concluding roundtable. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you all.
Bye bye. Excellent. Excellent.